How do we talk with children and youth about their vulnerability to climate change? It is already disrupting their lives and is going to get worse. If we tell them of our fears, do we risk hurting them? I didn't want to cause hurt, so had avoided having those conversations with children. But then I met teachers Joel and Simona and their 13-year-old son Oscar. I met them while working in Bali for a year. This is their story of facing climate reality together with young people at home and in school. Oscar's a introspective, sensitive, and really intelligent. Um, loves stories, loves to read on his own, um, and just really likes to join conversations with everybody. So if we're talking with people or just with each other, he'll jump in and, and want to be a part of that. He'll want to know what's, what we're talking about. He'll want uh, the context of what we're talking about. So, and he's always been that way. He's always been um, eager to understand um, what's going on around him. Mm -hmm. and just to be part of the conversation. Um, also, I guess um, it's important that he has never gone to a conventional school. Um, he's um, only been homeschooled, and um, when he wasn't homeschooled, he was going to a green school, which is an eco school in the jungle of Bali. He was allowed to learn what he wanted most of the time to follow uh, his interests. We came to Bali because uh, we wanted Oscar to go to green school. He was being homeschooled before we came here and um, we thought it would be great for him to be learning with other people. We have this routine of uh, going to the beach. It's, uh, it's uh, the time where we catch up as a family. We talk about how our day went and, you know, get some, get to move. Being at the beach, you feel like you can look at the horizon and, and move around freely and it's a little bit cooler. And, and we actually somehow being at the beach, we almost always end up having some kind of philosophical conversations. <laughs> we were walking on the beach and uh, I was talking to Joel and it was actually just the beginning of the rainy season. So a lot of, of plastic garbage was washing down the uh, little sewage down the river streams and then back up onto the, onto um, the that go into the water. So you know, the beach was really dirty and Oscar ran ahead and uh, he was um, sitting on the rocks on the beach and looking at the sunset. And as we walked up, I saw that he was um, he was crying and um, so I hugged him and and I asked him why he was crying and he said um, he cried because he had no future he said that he may not live to be as old as uh, we are or have children and or even if he lived what kind of life would it be i talked to him and, and i said that it was okay to be sad and that you know i could not tell him that it would be otherwise you know i um nobody could promise that i think it was that weekend when i was online and I wasn't particularly looking for anything, but I came across deep adaptation. And I, I, I think I must have just read the beginning of this. I don't even know what the context was of finding deep adaptation, but I started to read it and it seemed to me exactly what Simona had been talking about. As though, oh, here's something that's, that's saying, that's talking about climate change in the way that you've been talking about it um, so I, you should read this and I sent her the, I sent her the link to the article and I think he looked at it and 
Um, we saw how long it was and said, well, we should maybe print this out and, and read it together. So um, we, we had printed it out. We, uh, on a, it was a Saturday morning, Oscar and Simona and I sat right, right around here and just started reading. I was reading it out loud. Uh, we would stop every few paragraphs or when something came up that we thought Oscar might not understand and talk about it or ask him to rephrase something we've read and he would um, we have a discussion around that um, as we were reading it he became I think I think he became more more animated in his in his thinking and he showed that through his through his physical like, his up moving around twirling a stick around thinking and um, so I felt like he was already feeling motivated to, to do something um, about what he was hearing. To, and not so much to say like, uh, to do something about climate change, but to, to start doing something and living in a way that's going to prepare him for the kind of future he might be living in. If you feel like you really want to do something, what, what is it you want to do? And they said, I want to tell people about it. Um, and so we thought, well, what would be the most effective way for you to tell people about it? And uh, so he uh, thought that maybe he could do a speech at, at school, at the assembly. But um, then to prepare it, he would have to have time and help. And um, then they came up with the idea of him doing a quest project, because that is a project um, that um, middle schoolers do at the end of the middle school. Uh, so they do a research project and then they present in front of the whole school. And uh, the teachers said that it was too early for him to do a quest because, you know, it takes a lot of time to prepare and then he has to... Uh, well, he's in grade seven yes, and it's and for grade eight. That's the that's, quest projects are for grade eight. Yes, so he was, was basically no told no. But then he wrote another email to, to the teacher and he said, well, I would still like to do it. And is there any way I could do it? Maybe it doesn't have to be called Quest. And so they had a meeting about it and uh, then the teachers uh, decided that they were gonna support him. I was excited to hear Oscar did not take no for an answer. Oscar's quest would be to learn how to live in the face of collapse. I asked to have a chat with him, to hear for myself. Thanks for um, sitting down with me to chat. Yeah. Does it feel like there's a possibility this is the future or is it the sadness that this is likely? Yeah. Yeah. That was the sadness. I also thought how much animals would be extinct by then. Mm. I mean, there probably wouldn't be that much left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so fear about, sadness about what, what's happening in the world, but all, and then how you'll live in that future. I want to do gardening and learn how to learn survival skills that might be useful mm -hmm. in a collapse situation. Right. So you're less dependent on the supermarket. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I kind of want to do something about it. Mm. And me and my parents came up with an idea to do like a presentation mm -hmm. so that we can let other people know maybe what I think. Right. So you don't have opportunities to talk about this in school? Yeah, I don't really find like the moment, you know, like the context. There's never, never talking about issues or anything. So right now I'm doing the project where I'm going to be making a video mm -hmm. about my experience with this topic. Yeah. Emotional experience mostly. So the topic being not just climate but, this but the collapse. The collapse. Yeah. The, the sense you have that there will be a, some kind of breakdown in, what, in the way we live. Yes. The idea of bringing into classroom came from me actually talking to Oscar and having this anxiety about the future. And then I thought, well, if he has those feelings, 
he's probably not alone. There's probably a lot of children that, that feel that way and uh, there is no venue, there is no place for them to really talk about it and to learn about it. And um, so after we read the paper, we discussed it with Joel whether that would be a good way to bring this topic into the classroom, to actually look at this as a research paper and um, talk to kids about it. This was the first time I had heard of any teachers bringing the topic of societal collapse into their school. I wanted to know more. We found that actually kids just wanted to talk about it. So we had to actually adapt and, and change the course as we went because we thought it was more important to, to have that space for them to talk about it. A friend of mine who works at Green School was, was here and we were telling about him about the class and about the, the context of the class. And Yes, his wife, his wife she said, oh, it's very interesting because uh, we went to this dinner where we met this professor from England uh, who wrote a paper on this topic. And so I asked her what was the name of the professor. And, and then that's how we found out that uh, you were in Bali. My outlook on the future is painful enough for me and my colleagues. What would it be like to talk with young people about it? I'm a professor at a university, but I had not been to a classroom of school kids since I was at school myself. Oscar said I should go. It felt right to join him in his quest. Joining the circle on the floor, I asked the students whether they thought it was a good idea for their teacher, Joel, to have brought my rather difficult paper to their class. More for me what the paper has done is it's just like kind of changed the way I look at climate change in general. It's going to be our future and our kids' generation and it's going to be the upcoming generation who's going to come. And I find it is partially you know this knowledge and saying you are you should not know about it because you are too young for it I find that is a bit harsh because it's our future it's like it's like you know there's gonna be a bomb in the future but you won't tell anyone you know what I mean I find you should nothing's gonna change if you won't tell any people about it and I find or whoever says that students should not know about this I find that's almost quite selfish to say they shouldn't for their own protection but who at the end are you going to protect because actually it's going to do more benefit to anybody if you tell them about it and then have them figure out what to do about it knowledge is power and if you never tell them they never have the power to change anything so i want to know you know because what miss lee was saying i agree with the adults being selfish like I think it's our right to know that but it is also really freaking scary and it could also impact my decisions not for the better in a way so I haven't really decided how I feel like that but I do believe I rather have the knowledge of what could happen than not for sure from my age I feel like it's okay to tell but I, I'm I, but I can't really see if it would do any harm or good if it was for younger age, like like nine, right? Because they probably wouldn't understand as well. I didn't want to write an essay or do some art. I wanted to just write a story because that's how I think I think best. And so the story is basically just how this 12-year-old person um, deals, deals with climate change in terms of like holidays because it was like right before Christmas and so um, in the story um, the girl explores like what it was like before social collapse how everyone over ate you know capitalism and how her parents right now are kind of 
depressed, I guess, because they no longer have that. And, you know, in the end, she, she, um, what do I say, harvests these sweet potatoes that she, you know, worked really hard on as a Christmas present instead of, you know, toys or clothes for her parents. Can I ask a question? Do you imagine the future like that? I guess so. <laughs> yeah. If you grow up your whole life imagining and being told and actually participating in like having things makes me happy and that kind of mindset of like and that's how I think about things like going on a boat having a boat makes me happy like stuff like that then all you're gonna do when like collapse happens or any of that is just be sad that you don't have any things and you're still in that mindset but if you grow up knowing about this it's not gonna be the same shock like I think I would have rather learned about this when I was eight than when I was 18 like I think that was a mistake and it's no one's fault but it's just like a it gives you longer to sit with it and it lets it be a bigger part of you and it's harder to deny because it's something that's been with you since you were young like the values you gain when you're young stay with you your whole life and I think by telling adults you can already see it but between the difference between adults and us. Like, they're already more perceptive, right? We're more, not perceptive, but accepting of the idea, open to it. It's important to teach them about it because also I think why a lot of people deny it is like Nick was saying, it's like you grow up with values about like having things makes me happy or like certain luxuries in life make me happy. And I think that's why also a lot of people deny climate change. The thing you really said was, um, was the adapting part, you know? We, as humans, have always, always learned how to adapt. And I think that what's really affected me was when you said that we will need to learn how to adapt, but even when it happens is we are going to adapt, you know? It, like, collapse will happen one way or another, probably, because either it will be, like, organized into another like our society will choose to say okay we're going to stop doing this and we're going to change to a different system or it will like break down in its own by like losing food and stuff like that like you wrote in your article so i was kind of thinking also that i could do something about it I wasn't exactly thinking about preventing it or anything. I was just thinking about like softening my fall, like, you know, instead of like it happening and then me not being like, oh, damn, now what do I do? <laughs> like, I should be prepared for it. Like, have a garden or something if it would work to have a garden. Like, also have uh, have a community, have friends who, and yeah and maybe even make a local currency. I'm talking about with my mom. For my final for this class, I designed a class to teach my peers about uh, practical skills, as in a sense of preparing for the collapse. Make yourself better at dealing with, with other people socially and problem solving and mm -hmm. dealing with crisis and stress and trauma and kind of like training your mindset rather than training to live in in the world as it is right now wow. and I think there's also some like kind of messed up stuff with the idea of being like we can't tell them like I think that has a lot to do with like ego and guilt and kind of just like that ignorance is bliss let's just like send it until we die kind of thing and it, it's just not, I don't know, it seems wrong to me. I think it's just very important, if you introduce this, is go slowly, which I really liked about your class, is was go slowly and have their discussions, their opinions, and then always, because opinions matter in this type of situation, and understanding how other people feel about this is, I find, quite important in this way it's like a lot about these circles because then you also know you're not the only one.
Like that's why I value this time because it's a time to just like dive into it, buy into everything and talk to someone else who has the same ideas as you. Mm-hmm. Anyone else you talk to, it, it, you always jump back to that pushback where it's like, this isn't real. This isn't like, yeah. what if it's not going to happen? Mm-hmm. Like you can always just say that and the conversation's kind of over. I was impressed. I had no idea that we would explore so many different dimensions of anticipating collapse from climate change. I asked Oscar's parents to join me with the school counsellor and a teaching expert to reflect on what we had just heard. What do you think we can learn from what, what, we've, just, uh, what we've just done and experienced? I think what I saw Um, which was really unusual for me in the conversation with those young people, is um, the fact that they were not afraid of uh, discussing the whole range of experience around thinking about collapse and deep adaptation. They were talking about their emotional experiences. They were talking about um, feeling uncertain about things. Um, They were just as comfortable giving adults advice about the way things are as they were about looking to adults for advice Um, and I think that's um, something fundamental that is usually missing in conversations like this in schools which is um, young people are taught that there's a right and wrong answer and they mustn't speak out until they figured out what the right answer is Um, and I think that there aren't any right answers in this instance and those young people helped show us some of the best ways to explore some of these issues. There's probably lots of young people who feel the same way and uh, don't have a space to actually talk about it. A lot of the teachers that I've spoken to who say we can't bring these issues to children um, in secondary and in, in primary school um, it, that comes down to the fact that the adults themselves are scared. Um, you know, they're scared of uh, a lot. Our education systems frame the teachers as the experts, and they're scared of the fact that they might be in front of the class and not know some of the answers. And that's something that needs to be addressed first of all um, in you know in the ethos of the school. And some of the schools that I've worked with, where they have been most effective at having difficult conversations with children not just about climate or politics or society but about about um about poverty about violence anything like that is where they regularly daily or even you know weekly but preferably in every session that the every experience that the children have is have open dialogue where children feel safe to say I heard somebody say X, Y and Z on the news or in the playground or at home and I don't know what that means, you know, or, well, I, you know, I I feel angry about something. And in general, we make that not okay. We have to make it okay for children to bring some of those emotions that we usually say, no, they're negative emotions, they should be avoided at all costs. The most important thing was not the information for them, but for them actually being able to share how they feel about it Mm. or Mm. what they want to do about it. Basically just having this space for them to talk about it. You know, you need to be able to bring it to children in a way in which you're not bottling up your own fear and terror, Mm -hmm. because even if you think you're bottling it up, they know about it, they're connecting with that. Um, so there's a there's a big you know there's the wider dialogue around um, teachers' well-being, teachers mm. being being supported, feeling supported, having the space for dialogue and uh, connection as mm. well. It's almost like I'm thinking out loud here, but it's almost like you know like well-being going into schools. You would train one teacher who would be the kind of the well-being <coughs> person, and they'd go in and they'd run workshops. They'd train the teachers and and they'd help to facilitate some of that. Mm. Um, Whereas getting every teacher on board with it in a, in a school as like a curriculum, um, I don't know, it's, it's so big in terms of practicalities, like maybe like a system like that mm. would work. So you'd have your, you know, your core of people who go in and, and understand it, can facilitate at different age groups and then can support teachers mm. with the follow-up and parents because mm. you're going to have to do 
workshops for parents and parents, some parents mm. are going to be like, no, I don't want my child to know about this. Rather than talking about climate and collapse with younger children, there's just implications for what they are taught and not taught mm. and the way people talk about the future or not. Um, so maybe you don't have to talk about climate and collapse, but mm. there's just there's a whole paradigm that's shaping the way young children are being taught that needs to change. We only got on camera the reunion of Joel's class. He told me that when he first brought my Deep Adaptation paper to his students, there was shock, confusion and anger. These young people were given the chance to express and discuss those emotions and arrive at a different place by the time we join them. Their schooling is quite unique, but shows what is possible. The news was talking about uh, irreversible changes happening in the climate, and yet the, all, most of the articles would end, well, we still have the solutions and we only need the political will. And so at some point, I, I think I was starting to get anxious that that was not the truth. What is the real state that, that we are actually heading for collapse? I think it was good that you, we let people know that collapse is probable. I think it's okay to feel the sadness and the fear. And the sadness is what made me do the project that I'm doing and made me think about what I can do to save myself in the future. Today, our children are being forced to learn how to fit into an economy that's probably not going to exist for them. Instead, they can be helped to learn what they really want to know given the realities they face. We do not know for certain how or when societies will break down due to climate change, but we do know that not helping young people to discuss that would only make matters worse. Like all of us, our youth can sit in circles to express emotions, uncertainties and new ideas. Their upset and anger at what we have done to this world is understandable and could be a creative force. As adults, we must be ready to hold space for that and to accept that some people may not be able to forgive. But such resentments will not help them or us. Given the time to share and process their emotions, the young people I met for this film show that there is another way forward. Powerful forces may try to amplify any resentments, but for young people now can be a time to reject the tired stories of our destructive culture, to discover new ways forward by simply asking if something is kind, wise and creative. I think I'm not, I don't feel that sad anymore. I just feel like acceptance, like that that's probably going to be my future. Mm -hmm. And I just live how I am living now, but also I try to prepare myself for the future. Have you had conversations with friends about any of this? No, not really. Mm. They just want to hang out and have fun, or, or yeah, I don't, I don't really don't, bring it up. I don't, don't I don't see any moment where I can bring it up. I feel like it would kind of be weird if I bring it up just mm. randomly. You're going like, to send them your video? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> a few months later, I heard that Oscar's quest to make a film about deep adaptation was complete. As souls, we may have all decided to be here now at this liminal time for humanity. But as adults, we should not pretend that children today are so different to us that they will fix the future. We all have a role in collectively adapting to a changing environment. Oscar's quest was really to tell us about that. So if we've got more resources, skills and networks, then we do have more responsibility. So what are you going to do now?
we are joining the global youth climate movement today. What is Green School? We should be doing way more. We say to the world that we are the Green School. We lead in green education. We do have some amazing things here. We have beautiful campus in nature, solar batteries, gardens. We have lots of awesome teachers and other amazing minds in the community. And we have fun learning. Other people in schools can learn something from us, and that's great. But in the light of the new information we are getting from scientists about the ecological breakdown, we are also one of the most terrible schools on earth in our impact. Almost everybody at Green School flies here. We fly around for school trips. Many of us travel back to, in, to their home country on even short breaks like Nippy. I'm not an exception. I flew to Australia for Christmas holiday. We live in big villas. We drain the resources of this island without giving much back. We are hardly a good example of climate leadership and climate justice. If this is a real climate emergency, like the United Nations and scientists around the world tell us, if we are talking about coping with floods, fire, violence, starvation, migration, and even the, the breakdown of civilization in our own lives, then what are we, the Green School, actually doing about it? I do not feel this emergency in my day-to-day -day schooling. Nobody talks about it in the way that feels real. We will not be bystanders and observers of a climate change impact. We will have to live through them or die in them. We don't talk about it partly because we don't really know how to talk about it or what we should do about this crisis. It is scary to think this way. But like Greta Thunberg, who started the youth climate movement, says, it is time to panic. Because when we panic, then we will actually get up and do something real about it. The way I see it, right now, we are the problem. We are causing harm. We have to change. The school needs to change. I am not the one to tell you how. There probably isn't any easy way to do it. But to find the way, at first, we need to talk openly about it and be honest with ourselves. We need to admit where we fail and see what we can do now to make it so that we do more good than harm and then actually do what we set out to do, or go home. Thank you, and I hope we choose to be the change.